A Discourse on Love by Anne Kralkamp, 2007. Prelude. In Love Again, a novel by Doris Lessing, the subject is a woman my age, mid-60s, who inexplicably finds herself in love after 20 dry years in which her work had provided both purpose and fulfillment. Then, after that first shocking flutter of the heart, she found herself, over the next few months, falling in love again and again and again with different men in turn, most of them wildly inappropriate, to the point where she had to realize that whatever in love meant, it had nothing to do with the men that she desired. She then fell into a leaden, depressed state where she experienced her actual physical heart as ponderously heavy, burdened with mysterious, utterly unbearable pain and desolation, and a thirst, a hunger, a longing for the other so extreme as to make her consider suicide. As her awakening to love had astonished and embarrassed her, so the subsequent descent into an unimaginably deep, dark night of the soul overwhelmed and frightened her. Doris Lessing's character had not enjoyed, endured my kind of experimental, peripatetic life wherein gradually, over a period of decades and a number of intense relationships, I learned over and over again and more and more quickly to detach from the ecstasy and agony that love threw my way. Rather, she experienced the lover's wild leap and devastating fall all at once in a sort of Midsummer Night's Dream phantasmagoria during a year that she considered the gateway to her life's finale. And though she did find that powerful experience instructive in that it demonstrated her own vulnerability to what she had considered human foolishness, the novel ends almost where it began with a stoicism now tinged with bewilderment and regret. This essay is driven by an effort to understand and describe the door that can open when we move through the bitterness that attends our discovery of the heart's terrible longing. Introduction. One woman's remark decades ago still reverberates in memory. We were on a ski tour at the base of the Tetons. She was dressed in parka, muffler, gloves, headband, and earrings. I asked her, why earrings? Because I'm still the huntress, she replied, very matter of fact. She was single at the time. I was married. She's right. The state of being single does seem to be accompanied by its own set of accessories, not to mention states of mind. I winced to remember years of being seized awake in the middle of the night by fixations on men that sparked feelings in various shades of seeking, keeping, coveting, letting go, regretting, wondering, wishing, longing, pretending, hoping, and obsessing. These internal states accompany any woman still on the hunt. And since I worked as a professional astrologer, while lying there at 2 a.m. tensed with desire, frustration, hurt, regret, and or bitterness, I would also flip men's charts up on the insides of my eyelids and compare them to my own chart, one after another. Unlike counting sheep, this intricate analysis would jerk me into hyper-alertness. I'd bound out of bed, grab the astrological ephemeris, look again for clues. Who is Mr. Wright? Who is the one? Will I ever find him? Or how did I let him get away? How could he have left me? You know the drill. I'm so glad it's over. My family's glad it's over too, yet one of my nieces tells me that her mother, a devout Catholic, still keeps my picture on her bedside table and prays for me nightly. But what exactly is over? Intimate relationships with men? At 64, do I now head into old age with head bowed, forever widowed? Somehow I doubt it. I remain an exquisitely alive and sensuous human, wildly attracted to other humans, 
and I remain dedicated to both experience and understanding of male-female relationships as primary fuel for the human evolutionary thrust. My family looks upon my peripatetic path with curiosity and alarm. I, in turn, view their long-term partnerships with curiosity and bemusement. What would my life have been like had I followed this path? And what would I have learned from such a life? Not to mention, when would I have known I learned it? Not until my deathbed, I suspect. Who knows what goes on inside our deepest being while we still move through time? And inside the common core of a couple may reside what I have come to revere as the Holy of Holies, a mystery I don't ever expect to fathom. I realize that last statement is ambiguous. Do I mean that I don't pretend to understand what goes on inside the heart of long-term couples? Yes, I certainly do mean that. And though I don't understand them, I've observed some marriages over the decades, including those of my parents, my seven siblings, and one of my sons. I have learned to respect their commitments and to rejoice in their capacity for longevity, for I can sense how each person has deepened over time as an individual. In this chaotic era of fractured families, mine is unusual in that, for most of its members, marriage does apparently serve as an alchemical vessel for personal and interpersonal transformation. I bless them. Though I do not fathom what they have, I sense it well worth having. But the other implication unsettles me. For, if I, for it could mean that I don't expect to ever engage in another long-term male-female relationship in this life. Is this true? And if so, why? Because it's too late? I'm too old at 64? Well, certainly too old to ever celebrate a 60-year anniversary like my parents did a few years ago, but not too old for, say, 10 or 20 or maybe even a 30-year run. Would I want that? I'm not sure. First of all, the obvious. Most men my age and some years younger not only look and act but actually are physiologically older than I, sinking into decrepitude. They did not institute healthful food and exercise patterns when younger and now bulge with bellies, varicosities, and florid, swollen faces. Their backs hurt, they take medication, their shoulders hunch, they limp, they pro they're probably impotent, all turnoffs, and not just from a standpoint of physical attraction. I can see the writing on the wall. Sooner or later, and most likely sooner, I'd have to sacrifice my own life and needs as a caregiver. So, from a purely selfish perspective, why would I want to nurse a man with whom I had no history through old age, illness, death? On the other hand, I imagine that if we had slept comfortably through morning and evening routines for decades, we would hardly have noticed when our skin lost its luster and our hands started to shake, our rich and detailed memories of children, crises overcome, trips taken, mutual friendships, homes and careers lived in and let go, all food for thought and endless stories, would have cemented a shared reality. Moreover, any friction in our early years would have sloughed off the dross. The dross? How do you say that? We'd be reduced to a bright, clear flame, a singularity long fed by the encouragement of the one other who knows and cherishes us, warts and all. In such a context of a loving, long-term companionship, I imagine that by the time one of us grew more frail than the other, or got sick or disabled, the stronger, healthier one would naturally surrender to the other's increasing need, no matter what the sacrifice required or for how long. But meeting a man when he's old? Getting the downside with none of the goodies? How crass this sounds. Makes me want to issue a challenge to the other who would dare to greet me soul to soul. Hey you, surprise me. Shine your full self through that decaying bag of bones. In actuality, I don't even know if I'd like surprises. Not now, not anymore. Or is this just a crone's timeout? Individuation. 
I'm astonished to recognize that for the first time in my life, I feel complete, whole, that I no longer seem to need to project parts of myself onto men. I've enjoyed this new sense of internal integration for perhaps the past six months. And I must say it feels strange, alien, as if a different person occupies this body. I'm not used to the sense that there's nothing left to do in the area of relationships. That just to be on my own, in company with others on occasion, but more often alone, is enough. Indeed, I dare say that this new status feels fine. Indeed, luxurious, immensely satisfying. Jung would call my new sense of internal wholeness individuation, since I have apparently succeeded, at least for now, in letting go of projections onto men, which means in psychoanalytic terms that I've internally integrated the various animus figures that I so desperately sought in the outside world. Rather than needing to magnetize a man with this or that set of qualities as my companion, I seem to have uncovered these qualities in myself and feel quite content. I have yet to find a woman with whom I can discuss this new internal state change most of my female friends are either married, still on the hunt, or trying to land a skittish partner, or they are done with relationships, not because they feel internally whole, but because either they feel too old and or their so-called failed relationships have left them bitter and cynical. I don't fit into any of these categories. For despite my newly integrated condition and my apparent time out, I still find myself in mutual frisson Persone with men. I do not pursue these attractions, but I do enjoy them. So, what is love? When we meet another for whom we feel a romantic attraction, we tend to describe our initial hookup as falling in love. Within six months to two years, the intensity of the initial attraction normally fades or at least ratchets way down. The great light that seemed to emanate from the other has been turned off, stripping them of beauty, brains, sensitivity, range of interests, talents, animal magnetism, experience, and so on, whatever it was that drew us to them in the first place. This off-on switch or on-off switch is so remarkable that sooner or later the more psychologically minded cannot help but realize that the phrase in love actually means in projection, an illusion produced by the intensely creative power of our own needs, hopes, and expectations. For the Doris Lessing character, this discovery came as a shock, or it may steal in gradually, as the initial magical state of complete immersion in the other fades to the day-to-day -day reality of two very different people trying to get along. If the relationship weathers our disappointment, then we usually describe the reason we stayed together as we love each other. But what does this really mean? As the song says, what is this thing called love? It seems that we all experience love as the greatest value in human life, what we long for and can never get enough of. And of course, on a more exalted level, all religions speak of love as the underlying reality of God. But I've noticed that here on earth, once the honeymoon is over, then I love you segues into something much more prosaic. Our lives are now joined. Children, mortgages, money, work struggles, our different dreams, all clamor for attention. We hope with various addictions, we cope with various addictions and insecurities. How we move together through the constant interruptions, complexities and difficulties of sheer dailiness says a lot about our willingness to lay down personal agendas and blend with our partner to forge a common life. Some do this more easily than others, and not necessarily because they're more loving. Each of us comes with a unique, original nature, with some more suited to the adjustments that partnership requires. In the 20th century, up through the 1950s, we could pretty much take for granted male-female behavior in primary relationships as based on roles thought to be traditional and biological, not to mention theological. The man leads, 
the woman follows. The man works to provide economically for the woman whose place is in the home with their children. This thoroughly pragmatic arrangement secured stability in both family and society. Then all hell broke loose. Starry-eyed hippies determined to bust out of all roles and bring love, conceived a spontaneity and authenticity back into the world. Peace, love, dope, utopian idealism soon wrestled with another equally strong trend, that of angry feminists demanding male-female power redistribution. The fallout from this glaringly contradictory set of influences was, as we now realize, both extremely potent and decidedly mixed. Forty years later, when we look at the psychological dynamics of most male-female relationships today, they seem to fit into one or more of the following categories. In some relationships, one naturally leads and the other follows. In others, partners take turns or each leads in certain areas, or they don't. Instead, one dominates and the other obeys, or appears to. Sometimes the submissive one is actually passive aggressive, gets what he or she wants through surreptitious means. Any of these relationships might call themselves loving. I would rather describe them as, just as in the 50s, thoroughly practical, though society has relaxed its ideas as to which gender fits into which role, and though sometimes roles may overlap or reverse, the partners still play roles and still make it their main business as a couple to negotiate their separate needs, giving or giving in, in exchange for getting. In some cases, of course, one person refuses to give in, despite what the other wishes and must then either tolerate complete subjugation or leave, or the two compete for dominance. Though these kinds of unions usually end badly, others seem to live for the struggle and are addicted to drama. Like me. Like me. <laughs> I needed that total control. So I had to fall and gnash my teeth over and over again in subtle or blatant battles with lovers. And when I wasn't in battle, I was licking my wounds obsessing on what went wrong and how to make it right again. Like a lightning bolt streaking in slow motion through time, my life jerked between exalted highs and despairing lows. I identified aliveness with intensity. Loss. Now, after more than 40 years of relationship experience as an adult, I would say that the crucial test of what we glibly call love comes when we endure some kind of sustained loss. When the beloved dies or leaves or betrays us, reveals him or herself to be utterly other, not at all what we had imagined in our in love phase. Or for those like Doris Lessing's character who live at a more self-aware level, when we realize that the qualities we had ascribed to our lover were actually projections of our own unconscious needs, in neither case, our discovery hurls us from the heights of love, in quotes, always when I use the word, <laughs> into the abyss. We slog through bewilderment, abandonment, disillusionment, grief. But then what? How do we respond to our suffering? When in pain, it is natural for warm-blooded critters to shut down curl into a fetal position and wait to either die or get better. Our gut instinct is to close our hearts and build a defensive wall against further hurt. Shut down, armored against our agony, there seem to be three alternative ways to proceed. We make do with our situation, though cynical, with greatly diminished expectations, we engage in a campaign to try to change the other, or if we leave and quickly or eventually cast about for another with whom to enter the same song and dance. The first choice drops us into the land of the living dead. Since we've squelched our life force, nothing new can happen. The hardening of our hearts accelerates the march towards death of the physical body and meanwhile, we cannot help but leak or spew negativity, contaminating our environment. 
The second choice is the one I've jumped into time after time, though I've long known better. And of course, it never works trying to control someone, just creates polarity and conflict as the other fights for his own life. All along, this choice is fraught with delusion. I inflate, seeing what I do as helping or serving, and so feel heroic. Then when the other refuses, I deflate into victimization and martyrhood, not to mention frustration, resentment, bitterness, depression. More rarely, we take this mode to the extreme, turn violent, try to force the other, dominate, or if necessary, crush the other. The third alternative, cut and run, is more often the man's choice. Women are likely to try the second alternative for years, always with the hope that if I love him enough, he will learn to love me. Finally, conceding defeat, but still assuming the grass is always greener, we leave one partner, blame him for what went wrong, re-enter the hunt, and wonder why the next partner resembles the first. A fourth alternative. In the last few years, I've discovered a fourth alternative, and that is to remain open and vulnerable, no matter what, no matter how much it hurts. In fact, I've discovered that if I do what seems counterintuitive at the time, if I truly surrender to the pain of loss, then it is as if I come upon a secret door that I did not even know existed. And this door, I soon realize, opens into a room filled with what I've been seeking all along, love's gold, love's treasure. What I suggest here may sound both absurd, who wants to be the masochist, and absurdly simple, it can't be that easy, but don't get me wrong. Though it may seem stupid and simplistic to ordinary consciousness, in my experience, such surrender is extremely difficult in practice. Not only my instincts, but the conditioning of my entire life militates against it. To intentionally touch into my own terrible emotional wound defies both instinct and common sense. I do it anyway. In this exercise, I deliberately and voluntarily move awareness into the place in my body where the pain is centered. In my 40s, I would feel it as if someone had kicked me in the solar plexus with a boot. In my 60s, I feel pain more in my heart, as if an elephant stands on my chest. Now I can look upon the difference between the two locations and note my own progress. For my center of gravity does seem to have shifted from the solar plexus chakra, the power center where I learn the limits of my own power, to the heart chakra where I allow the heart to open and attune to others with no expectations. Up through my 40s, whenever emotional physical pain threatened to take me under, I would instantly connect into my mind, my ego, and stay there so that I would not double up in agony, not stay in bed all day. Desperately, my ego mind would make up ideas as to why I was feeling so terrible and dwell there on someone in the outside or inside world, present, past, or imagined future who had caused me, in quotes, to recoil. My obsession with the other as cause of my pain was an unconscious attempt to distract me from my body's painful feelings and serve to justify them so that I could feel better or superior to the other. Like everyone else in a culture inherited from Rene Descartes who coined the phrase, I think, therefore I am, and who labeled the body as a machine completely separate from the mind, my mind was me and my body an inconvenient encumbrance that I had to drag along behind. This process of reflexively slipping out of my body into my mind continues. Patterns imprinted from birth cling. And yet, strong as this pattern is, from my early 20s on, I've also felt intermittently driven by a very strong conscious need to let it go.